Hey guys, welcome to Did You Get That On Film? On this podcast, we deep dive into horror movies, so it is full of explicit content as well as spoilers. Please be advised. Now, let's get to the show. is did you get that on film where we discuss characters in terrible situations that we will never find ourselves in i am your host dp and with me is someone who knows to keep their ass at the house when the street lights come on Mm. my girl ruth what's up ruth hello hello what are we doing today we are going to be doing tales from the hood Ooh. This is actually going to be the fourth and final movie in our Black History Month uh, movie series. All February, we've been highlighting movies that either are created by Black filmmakers or highlight Black actors or stories. So far this month, if you guys are just tuning in, we did Night of the Living Dead. We did Candyman, the 2021 requel, and then The People Under the Stairs. So, Tales from the Hood. This was directed by Rusty Kundeef, and it was also written by Rusty Kundeef and Darren Scott. And this was released in 1995. So this is a horror anthology film, and so... It's comprised of, there's like a prologue, four short stories, and then an epilogue. And it follows the same kind of flow as Tales from the Crypt. I think that the director got a lot of his inspiration from Tales from the Crypt. So that's why you get those vibes when you watch it. But it was like repurposed to tell Black horror stories. Tales from the Hood actually has, I guess it would be considered two sequels. Yeah. Yeah, there's Tales from the Hood 2 and Tales from the Hood 3. They're very similar in format. Yeah. Clarence Williams doesn't reprise his role in the second one, so that role is taken over by Keith David, who is also a very great and animated actor. Um, So a respectable choice. And Uh then in the third one, the role is taken over, I think, by Tony Todd, right? Yeah. Obviously a also very respectable choice. Very amazing actor. So there's two other ones. If you guys want to catch those, this is the one that has become, I guess, like the cult classic. The one that is like the go-to, the original. Correct. So, funny enough, this is actually one of the first recordings that we did. We've always wanted to do an episode on this movie, um, but we did decide to hold it because we felt like Black History Month would be a better time to showcase it because it's definitely a part of Black history. Um, It definitely has a lot of messages to put out there. Uh, We just kind of went back and, you know, because we've gotten a little better over time with our production. So we went back and we kind of touched up a few spots. But overall, you know, we're we're really excited to finally be putting this one out. Right? Yeah. It was exciting to know that it was going to be heard because we recorded it with our initial... um, Batch. Well, batch. When we first started, we recorded so many episodes so we were really excited for everyone to hear it and there's definitely a lot to discuss in terms of the movie its production its cast and its message (laughs) yes and then i did want to give a little shout out to one of our listeners wolf dad if you're listening thank you before we put it out, you did 
request it, even though we did have it on the books, we're always happy when people request things. So we're really happy that we had this one in the chamber for you. If anybody else ever wants to hear anything, please be like Wolf Dad and just let us know. We are happy to do requests. And yeah, let's just uh, jump right into it, shall we? Yes. Just a note, this movie, because of the way that it's shot, it's an anthology, so it has these different stories. I'm not really going to do the kill count in this one. It isn't really that type of movie. So we're just kind of going to go through it and just focus on the stories instead of the kills. So yeah. The first portion, so the prologue, it's titled Welcome to My Mortuary. So the movie opens, and there's three drug dealers. So there's Stack, Ball, and Bulldog. And they are arriving at Sims Funeral Home to purchase some drugs from Mr. Sims, the person that runs this funeral home. <laughs> Mr. Sims is played by Clarence Williams III, and I feel like he is absolute proof that there are no small roles, only small actors, because this man never half-asses anything. If, if he is cast in a role, he's going to play the shit out of that role, and there will be no exceptions. Because he is not really in this movie that much, you know, as far as screen time, but he is going to be kind of our storyteller, our narrator. So when they first arrive, Mr. Sims is playing the organ, which should have been their like first red flag. They get there and Mr. Sims claims that he has found just like a whole mess of drugs in an alley. And he himself is not a drug dealer. So selling, he's like, you know, selling drugs is new to me. He's a mortician, but he says that he found it and he wants to get rid of it. And so as he's walking through, he opens up a casket and it has the body of Clarence Smith inside of it. Now, he says that he's hidden the drugs in his mortuary and he, he asks the, the drug dealers to help him get to the drugs because it's just so much he can't even lift it itself. He's like putting a lot on it. So already this is kind of suspicious. But along the way, he's like, well, since we're here, let me tell you the story of this man, Clarence Smith. So he says that Clarence was rumored to have heard the voices of the dead speaking to him, calling out his name. And so from there, we are then transported into our first story of the anthology. So this is Clarence Smith's story, Rogue Cop Revelation. And so it opens up and Clarence Smith is a young black police officer. He's a rookie. And he's being taken out by his new white partner, Newton Hauser. And so they are pulling up to the scene of what looks like a traffic stop. And there's already two other police officers there. So Newton, his partner, calls it an out of place. And that is because it is a black person in a white neighborhood. So. When the black man that's been pulled over tells them that they don't have probable cause to pull him over, one of the cops named Billy actually like smashes his tail light, and then the cops start to punch the man. And so they're beating him up. They already know who he is. Clarence Smith doesn't recognize him yet, but they send him to the car to go like run his plates. And Clarence sees that the man that they've pulled over, his name is Martin Ezekiel Morehouse. And he's actually a city councilman and an activist who has been fighting police corruption in the city. And he's actually been getting a lot of crooked cops fired for selling drugs. This is why the police, these white police officers are picking on him. So one police officer, Strom, actually pushes Morehouse's head through his car window 
and it causes Morehouse to turn and punch him. So this prompts the officers, Newton, Clarence's partner, Billy, and Strom to brutally beat Morehouse with their nightsticks. Billy Holiday's strange fruit is actually playing in the background. And for anybody that doesn't know what that song is, it was a poem about lynchings in the southern United States. And Billy Holiday took the poem and made it into a song. She was very impacted by the lynchings that were happening. So Strom actually would have strangled Morehouse, except Newton stops him, but only because he doesn't want Strom to kill Morehouse in front of Clarence, because Clarence is a rookie, he's black, he doesn't want him to tell. But Morehouse is very, very badly beaten at this point. So Clarence insists that Morehouse should be taken to a hospital, and the officers agree in front of him. But once he's out of earshot, we hear Newton tell Strom, you know what you have to do. So we know that Morehouse is probably not going to walk away from this situation. So Clarence and Newton leave Morehouse with Strom and Billy, trusting that they'll take him to the hospital. And I was like, how naive of Clarence. But Clarence tells Newton that Billy and Strom need to be reported for what they did. And Newton is just like such a piece of shit in this scene because essentially he's like, well, Morehouse went for Strom's gun, which is false. And Clarence is like, that didn't happen. But Newton says, you know, at the end of the day, even if they did go too far, they're cops. And as a fellow officer... Clarence should never break the code. You never want to rat out other officers. So Clarence just keeps his mouth shut in this situation. Strom and Billy, of course, do not take Morehouse to the hospital. Instead, they drive Morehouse's car to some desolate docks. And Strom gives Morehouse a huge overdose of heroin and the this is heroin that he, Newton, and Billy have been dealing. So they are obviously crooked cops. And then they plant some more drugs in the trunk of Morehouse's car. And then they push his car into the water with Morehouse still inside. So he is killed. Now, we cut to one year later. And Clarence is drinking heavily because he is racked with guilt that he didn't do anything to help Morehouse. Additionally, we see there's some newspaper clippings in Clarence's room stating that when Morehouse was found dead, he had drugs in his system, drugs in his car, and so the newspaper labeled him a drug dealer and a, a hypocrite because he was supposed to be fighting against that. So Clarence starts to hear Morehouse's voice telling him to bring him the cops who killed him. And so Clarence goes walking the streets because he really can't sleep. He's being driven crazy by these voices. And so he sees a mural of Morehouse, which prompts him to have a vision of a crucified Morehouse on the cross, just repeating the words, bring them to me. So Clarence vows to do just that. So Clarence is able to convince Newton, Strom, and Billy to meet him at Morehouse's grave on the anniversary of the murder. That sound, don't that sound like a setup to a graveyard at night? On the anniversary of this guy's murder? I was like, nah. Absolutely not. But I guess because, you know, they're like police officers, like white male police officers, they kind of, I'm sure they don't feel like anything bad could happen to them. them. Uh Uh-huh. So when they get there, Newton says that he misses Clarence and he hasn't seen him in a long time. And Clarence is basically like the phone works both ways. Also, how fucking weird. (laughs) That's such a weird thing to say to him. Like, the fuck are you talking about? You know what's up. Right. Don't play in my face. So at this point, we kind of find out that Clarence 
is no longer a cop. This It had such an effect on him, what happened to Morehouse, that he quit being a cop and, you know, he just kind of took to drinking. And that's kind of where he's been. So Clarence confronts them about what they did to Morehouse. And Strom is lying through his teeth. He's telling Clarence that they tried to take Morehouse to the hospital, but he didn't want to go. And Clarence is like, bullshit, because that doesn't make any fucking sense. Like, Morehouse was at that point was, like, unconscious. So you're lying. And Clarence is even more upset because to add insult to injury, like, you, you killed Morehouse and that was wrong, but you also destroyed Morehouse's reputation. And he's dealing with the guilt of just quitting the force instead of taking the initiative to turn them in so clarence convinces them to go to morehouse's grave to pay his respects newton is actually planning on killing clarence once they get there and newton is like a real piece of shit because like billy and strom are pieces of shit but newton was his partner so he's like an extra layer Michael Massey, who plays him, always plays a fucking terrible ass. Shitty. He has that face. That face. That fucking face on your face. Yes. So when they get there, Strom decides that he's going to pee on Morehouse's grave. And then he orders Billy to do the same. And Billy agrees because he's a bitch. So basically, Strom is like, you too, chicken? Kind of to get him to do it. But he's having a bit of stage fright. So he's standing there struggling and Newton and Strom actually point their guns at the back of Clarence's head. And just as they're about to kill him, Morehouse's hand bursts from his grave and drags Billy into the ground by his genitals. I loved it. I know. (laughs) Justice. That scared scared the shit out of me though. (laughs) I know. So Strom responds to this by shooting the grave like a fucking idiot. And I think Newton is like, what the hell is that going to do? So then Morehouse's coffin like explodes from the grave and it reveals a dead Billy inside with a zombie Morehouse standing over him. Strom and Newton start shooting Morehouse, but obviously that does nothing. So they run away. They jump in their patrol car and they try to speed away, but Morehouse is like hot on their heels. They are super shook and they end up crashing their car and Morehouse jumps on top of the car and he actually pulls Strom through the roof and he decapitates him. So Newton is hysterical at this point and he jumps out of the car and he shoots the car's gas tank, causing the car to explode with Morehouse still on top of it. So he thinks that he's killed him at this point. Why? (laughs) Why? I don't know. Because I don't know because he's already dead. That doesn't make any sense. But they're dumb. So as Newton is trying to run away, he finds himself standing in front of that mural of Morehouse that we saw earlier. And Newton is like, losing it okay so he's stumbling through an alley doesn't know what the hell is going on and morehouse ends up catching up to newton in this alley and he uses like some telekinesis to pick up a bunch of dirty used needles off the ground and kind of sends them flying at newton's body Newton actually ends up getting pinned to a cross that is at the bottom of Morehouse's mural. And then Newton's body like literally melts into the mural and he himself becomes a part of the painting and he is crucified on this cross. Clarence catches up to Morehouse and asks him like, are you satisfied, brother? And Morehouse says, uh, no. No, bitch, you thought you... Oh, oh, (laughs) you thought you was getting off the hook? Bitch, you thought. (laughs) So Morehouse was like, bitch, where the fuck were you when I needed you, brother? And so then we cut to Clarence's ends up in a mental institution. 
And we hear two orderlies talking outside of his room and they're talking about how he used to be a cop, but now he's like a homicidal maniac and that he killed three cops in one night. So all this stuff that Morehouse did, this all was blamed on Clarence. And that's how Clarence's story ends. And we cut back to the Sims mortuary and Stack, Ball, and Bulldog. They're walking through the mortuary with Mr. Sims, reflecting on this story. As they should. As they should. And so Mr. Sims is giving them a look into another casket. And we don't see what he looks like, but apparently the person in this casket is super fucked up. And that is going to lead us into our next story because Mr. Sims starts to tell them the story of a boy named Walter, a.k.a. Ahmad. Oh, Ahmad. (laughs) No, we got to go back to Roll Call. So, yes. So now let's reflect on Clarence's story before we move on. Do you think that Newton, like, He's stuck in that mural. Like, he is aware that he's in that painting. So I thought about that because the look on his face suggests that to me. I hope that that's his punishment. I really didn't like him. It's always funny. There'll be cops. They'll be mad that someone's trying to bring police corruption to light. And they'd be corrupt. (laughs) Right. This one was very frustrating. And, like, they got their comeuppance, right? But it is very frustrating because at the end of the day, they were crooked cops. And now nobody knows that they were crooked cops, right? And so Morehouse's legacy was, like, forever tarnished. Like, he's forever labeled a hypocrite. And then these very obviously hypocritical cops just kind of go down as... Victims. Right. I don't like that. I didn't like that. That wasn't justice enough for me. Well, you know what? I thought the punishment in itself was really just for a black lens of what happens when you are complicit. Because at the end of the day, and we see it all the time, whether they're murderers or not, white people are always going to get the BOTD, the benefit of a doubt. Yes. They were going to be victims no matter what. And the real punishment is Clarence, you know, because you didn't stand up. You caught all of that. Right. You're going to suffer. So I know what you're saying. Like, it's frustrating because it's like they didn't really get their comeuppance. But I think the story is to tell it to us. For us in our community, it's a matter of this is what's going This is what happens. You know, when you don't stand up. And then he was like, he framed them. You are the one who I'm punishing the most because you... You're not on code, brother. You you were about police code. Then you quit the job. So it was like, fuck the police code. You still didn't go back and tell. Right. That's my (laughs) thing. That is my thing. Once you quit, what are you protecting? It's not like you have to be on this force anymore. Like, they have no power over you. But I guess I, I was wondering, though, when Morehouse was, like, punishing him, I was like, I wonder, what could Clarence have done differently he's a black rookie and these are white cops that have been working in these roles for years would it have made a difference maybe not at all but i mean you don't know it's kind of like we gotta take about it think about it we touched on it but morehouse this is his stance you know he's fighting a good fight you know He died for that cause. And it's like, you couldn't even go back and just say what you saw? He like, you bitch. I mean, really. You bitch me. Right. Even if you were like, okay, I'm not going to rat on these cops to like my superiors. Even if you didn't do that, you didn't even tell his story to the newspapers and stuff. The people that were like crucifying him in the media but you let his legacy go down like this when you could have been a voice. Even if those cops didn't get in trouble, another side of the story could have been put out there. And you died anyway. Right. Right, because we're here looking at, looking at your body. So did, so did he kill himself? I don't really know because you don't really get into like how he dies. You think he went back for him? You think Morris went back for him? I don't 
think so. I don't think Morehouse killed him. I don't I don't even think that's what he wanted to do. I think he wanted him to end up where he ended up. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm thinking like did you think he haunted him still? Maybe. Maybe he didn't go back and kill him, but you think he ever got rid of him? And just like drove him drove him crazy? Maybe. I mean he could have. I don't think Morehouse wanted him to live. I'm just thinking to myself, like, how he died is he was obviously haunted until he killed himself. The goal was for them all to be dead. They all took part, whether in- intentionally or not, they all took part in his death, so he was going to make sure they all suffered. I think he never was going to be satisfied that all four of them were dead. Right. That was a hard one to watch. So, okay, so let's get to the next one because I found this one very difficult to watch. So this one's titled Boys Do Get Bruised. And so we meet Walter Johnson, who is lying awake in his bed and he's scared. And we see his doorknobs start to rattle. And so then we cut to Walter starting his first day at a new school. So immediately... Walter is bullied by this kid named Tyrone and he gets beat up. Poor thing. And I felt like the teacher, Mr. Garvey, I was like, I feel like he didn't punish these kids enough for my liking. Cause why are you beating up on this poor little boy? But I'm, 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 I was about to call him Ahmad. Walter goes to the nurse's office and the nurse and Walter's teacher, Mr. Garvey, they notice that Walter has some bruising on his face and he has a black eye. And Mr. Garvey asks Walter if Tyrone, the bully, hit him in the eye. And Walter says no. And he asks him, you know, it, was it your mother or your father? And Walter says, no, his father's dead. And so the nurse is like, well, these are not fresh bruises. These bruises are at least a few days old. And so when pushed, Walter claims that the bruises are from a monster who came after his father died. So I felt like, I don't think that Mr. Garvey necessarily handled this situation correctly. And I know that this was like the 90s and stuff like this wasn't talked about as much, but... Mr. Garvey, I mean, obviously, he doesn't believe Walter, okay? So, you know, he's just kind of like, that's ridiculous. Like, let me know when you want to tell me the real story. And Walter is really disheartened by this because, you know, he tells Mr. Garvey, the monster told me that nobody would believe me. And he walks out. So, cut to that night, and Walter is once again lying awake in bed, and we hear these loud stomps. This the monster is coming to his door. Walter had moved furniture in front of his door, and the monster is like beating against the door, trying to push it in. And it takes him forever, but finally the monster gets into Walter's room. We actually see a clawed hand wrap around the door and push it in. And poor Walter is distraught and he's like crying. And it really, really broke my heart. It was like really sad to watch. So cut to the next day at school and Walter shows up again with some really deep bruising on his arms. The nurse bandages Walter up. But that night at his house, we hear the sound of Walter being beaten by the monster yet again. And Walter is wailing. The the next day at school, while the other kids go out to play, Walter stays inside of his classroom and he is drawing pictures of Tyrone and the monster. Walter explains to Mr. Garvey that by drawing these images of the things that he fears and then destroying them, he can actually make them go away in real life. And he says that he's going to burn the picture of his monster. And... Mr. Garvey, at this point, is now rightfully concerned, and he wants to talk to Walter's mother. And I feel like, I don't know, Mr. Garvey is kind of dense in this situation because I feel like any other teacher would reasonably assume that Walter is being abused at home. Correct. 
Mr. Garby's not, he's not really getting that. So Walter says his mother really doesn't want to hear about the monster, though, because they've already had to, like, move a bunch. Again, pointing to abuse. But Mr. Garby says that he thinks that together they can figure out a way to solve Walter's problems. So Walter's like, that's all fine and good. But after Mr. Garvey leaves, Walter ends up crumbling up the drawing that he'd made of Tyrone. And this causes the real life Tyrone to just collapse and fall down some stairs. And he actually breaks. <laughs> I didn't mean to laugh. I swear to God, I only laughed because you laughed. At- <laughs> you know, I'm about to say. <laughs> Stop, because I'm, I'm going to go to hell and it's your fault. <laughs> So it Tyrone collapses, falls down some stairs, and he breaks both of his arms and both of his legs. Yeah, when he come out there, the other piece would be like, "Damn, <laughs> boy, must have weak bones." <laughs> he shaking his head, be like, "Damn, he boy, must have weak bones." <laughs> because the teacher, okay, so like. So, like, there's already a teacher out there, right? And so Mr. Garvey runs out and he's like, damn, what the hell happened? Because Tyrone is fucked up. In this case, Tyrone is going to the emergency room. Tyrone is in trouble. And so there's this fellow teacher who is just, it's like, I don't know. I know that he wasn't meant to be comic relief. But this, <laughs> I'm fucking, he's so whatever. I am crying. He's just like, he's so just he's like, whatever about it. Because Tyrone is like in a full body cast coming down the stairs. Right. So so when when Walter crumbles up this paper, you can hear like some pretty blood curling screams. Tyrone is very fucking injured. He looks so fucked up, and the teacher just like, damn, boy must got weak bones. And I'm just like, they're trying to make <laughs> sense of how could this possibly happen? Because a fall down the stairs is like, okay, that's one thing. You might break one arm. You might break one leg. He broke both arms and both legs. The way this fucking teacher said, the boy must have weak bones. I was dying. Shook his head and went on with his day. That was it. That was, he was like, well, that takes care of that. I solved the problem. Everybody get back to what you were doing. The boy has weak bones. I was like, damn, that shit is so funny. And it wasn't supposed to be. But later that night, (laughs) Mr. Garvey visits Walter's home and he asks Walter's mother, Sissy Johnson, a.k.a. Joy from Friday. And when I saw her, the only thing I could think of was, who the fuck you go to the show with last night? (laughs) I don't think about that line. My line is always... Uh uh-uh, uh, cause he can think you're slick. Ask that bitch for some motherfucking money. <laughs> oh, you ain't got to lie, Craig. You ain't got to lie. Uh uh-uh. uh, who the fuck is that bitch? <laughs> That's Dave from across the street. Oh, what the fuck she doing in there? Yeah, Craig, what she doing in there? <laughs> Stop it, he was so messy. <laughs> yeah, Craig. Like, total screen time, I think she was only in that movie for like, what, six minutes, but the impact. Is that. <laughs> She was, it had to be less than six. It had to be four. It had to be four. It's nothing. When I say it's she not in that movie, but she in that movie. She's, She's one, one of the, the most, most memorable parts of the movie. We love you, Paula. Paula. <laughs> You're amazing. And this is one thing that we didn't mention. This movie is filled to the brim with just great black Hollywood actors. Everybody that you see, you're like, oh my God, I know her. I know him. So, back to, sorry, this is very serious. So, Sissy Johnson, Walter's mother. So, Mr. Gary is asking her about all the bruises that he's been getting. And Miss Johnson claims that Walter's injuries are just the result of him being clumsy. She doesn't know where the fuck he gets it. But she's also, like, coming on really strong to Mr. Garvey. And Mr. Garvey's like, I'm here to talk about your abused child. So... It isn't until Mr. Garvey mentions the monster that Sissy has had enough. And she calls Walter down 
and she demands that he just stop making up these stories and telling Mr. Garvey about all this monster foolishness. And so she sends Walter up to his room. Just then, Sissy's, like, I mean, clearly abusive boyfriend Carl comes home. I mean, the whole mood in the house changes. He's getting home from work. And he walks in and Walter's mom was like, oh, he was just leaving. But Mr. Garvey is like not taking the fucking hint because clearly Carl is abusive. But he starts talking to Carl about Walter's bruises and mentions the monster that Walter is afraid of at home. And he actually gives Carl a picture of the monster that Walter drew. And I, at this point, I was... I felt like Mr. Garvey is just being very, very dense, right? Because it's just so obvious. You think in the sense that it's like as soon as he walked in, you were like, oh, well, he's getting his ass beat. Right. It's just because of the way that Walter's mother reacts. It just, it. When I was at how she was, it's just like, he's like, oh, it's the monster. And it's just like, you know, you know, it's not a fucking monster. Come on now. The, the writing of it. It speaks a lot to us, but just if you can read social cues and body language, the way that Sissy reacts when he gets home, the way that Carl is, his whole demeanor, it just screams abusive. Like, he looked like he about to fight you, because you were not The whole time, and Mr. Garvey's just, like, not taking the fucking hint. So Carl, you know, Mr. Garvey explains all of this to him, and Carl says he'll talk to him. And then Carl tells Mr. Garvey, he's like a, it's pulling an Angela Bassett, get your shit and get out. Yeah. That's why you don't do house calls with his teachers. Right. So now that Mr. Garvey is out of the house, Walter is in his room. We hear the monster footsteps, these heavy footsteps, and he, they're storming up to Walter's room. And we can see the monster enter the room and surprise surprise <laughs> it's yeah in case nobody guessed it at this point it's carl carl is the fucking monster it's just we've been seeing it kind of through walter's imagination it, when we see the claws and stuff it's really just fucking carl he's just a piece of shit so carl is mad that walter is drawing fucked up pictures of him okay to be fair though Walter was drawing some fucking pictures. And Carl is played by David Allen Greer. This might be funny. So I I actually put in my notes, can we please take a moment to shout out David Allen Greer, who really put his foot in this part because... And in Ahmad's da- ass. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> because David Allen Greer, it's just like his face screams comedy to me. He's playing an asshole, but, like, the shit that he's saying... He said, she dropped pictures of motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> like, he offended. That's what really got him mad. Basically, like, you're drawing these fucked up pictures of me. Like, you think this shit is funny? And so David Allegra really sells the, like, piece of shit role for this. Because you would never think. So he comes up. And Carl starts to attack Walter, and he does this thing where he's like, he keeps fucking hitting people in the nose with the palm of his hand. The way that he's like hitting them is so goofy to me. But he's attacking Walter, and then Sissy comes running in, and so she's trying to get him to stop beating Walter. And so, because she intervenes, Carl takes off his belt and he starts to, like, whip her with the belt because she's disrespecting him. She is also selling in her ass book very well. Very well. She's crying and bleeding and then, like, a mind's over there crying and David Ellie Green is just saying all kinds of shit. I'm just like, damn, okay, it's like a mixture of horror and comedy. I know, but it's it's really not supposed to be funny. The only thing that's making it funny, if David Allen Greer had been quiet during this scene, we would have been like, damn, this is really fucked up. 
But it's the fact that he's talking so much and the shit that he's saying and the fact that it's David Allen Greer. It's like, I can't take it seriously. And he is whipping her ass literally with a belt. And it really is heartbreaking because Walter is crying, obviously. Like, he's hysterical. But while all of this is happening, Mr. Garvey, who's been sitting outside in his car, is just taking his fucking time using his degree to put two and two together, which he has not been able to do up until this point. So fucking stupid. I know. But he looks up in the window and he actually can see Carl beating Sissy. Mr. Garvey runs back into the house. He runs and he knocks on the door and Sissy actually lets him in because Carl has fucking lost it. She getting the ass whooped. Right, but then so is Mr. Garvey because he comes (laughs) in to try to save the day. (laughs) (laughs) Dante, Mr. Garvey gets his ass kicked. I wish that the director had made it even like a fair fight. Mr. Garvey is the director. Oh, is he really? Yes, that's Rusty. Why did he get his ass kicked so bad? Stop, because it's not even a fair fight. I mean, Carl is dog walking Mr. Garvey, and Mr. Garvey's like supposed to be the hero. No. Like, I guess the best thing that he did was like take some licks that Carl could have been giving to Sissy or Walter. And so Carl is about to beat Sissy with a cast iron skillet. I mean, he's, he was probably going to kill her. When Walter, who d- is the hero of this story, because Mr. Garvey wasn't doing shit, Walter grabs the drawing that he made of the monster and he begins to just like fold it and twist it and crumple it up, causing Carl's body to fold and twist and crumple up, literally. He looks like origami. But the crazy thing is he's still talking shit. He's a tangled ball of yarn on the kitchen floor, but he's talking mad shit. I'm going to kick your motherfucking ass. You think it's going to stop me? (laughs) Right? I was like, Carl, just chill out. So Sissy then stomps on the wadded up piece of paper, the drawing, and blood splurts out. It's crazy because Sissy is worried about what will happen if people find Carl like that. And she's like, nobody's going to believe us. And I'm like, if people found him like that, they'd be just as fucking confused as everybody else in this fucking house. They're not going to blame you. (laughs) No. They're going to be asking God, why does he look like a fucking carnival pretzel? Like, I was But I was like, sissy, I think you'll be okay. But then I thought this was crazy. Mr. Garvey's solution to sissy's worry is to give the paper to Walter, who then burns the paper without hesitation. And so that burns Carl's body along with it. And I was like, well, if you couldn't explain why he was a carnival pretzel, how are you going to explain how he's a burnt carnival pretzel? I was like, I don't think that that helps. Mr. Garvey is a goddamn idiot. No offense, but Mr. Garvey, you helped zero. If anything, you made all of these situations much worse. Because I was like, Walter was going to burn that regardless. You know what I mean? You came in here and got all of our asses kicked. And I also just feel like, why did the mod, when he realized that, oh shit, that boy broke up in pieces because I tore the paper up, I would have just drew the fucking paper. As soon as I got home, he gonna get here, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just rip the paper up. I would have burned it walking home. Yeah, just start fucking ripping it up. Why am I you with my ass? <laughs> I don't know. So, that story is done. Carl is dead. And so we cut back to Sim's funeral home and we see that it's Carl's burnt pretzeled corpse that's inside the coffin. That's what Stack, Ball, and Bulldog are. That's the corpse that they're seeing. So Stack slams this casket because who wants to look at that shit? So when he slams it, it actually causes a doll to fall off a nearby shelf. And so Mr. Sims picks up the doll and he explains that when somebody's body has been through a lot of trauma, 
the soul becomes displaced. The doll acts as a place for the soul to survive until it can move on. And Ball asks, man, are you for real? <laughs> Which Mr. Sims says yes. But it's like 50 decibels higher than would ever be necessary. And I don't know why these three are not getting the fuck out of here. I, I'd be so alarmed. Because this man, first of all, okay, so we need to talk about that. He looked crazy as fuck. His hair, he got like a flat top going one way, and then it's just like a fro. It's weird. And it's a, it's a reason why it looks like that. Right. And then he, he's very eccentric, like one eye like twitching the whole time. And at no point are they like, maybe this isn't a good idea. No. So Mr. Sims tells him that he found the doll in a home in the South. And then that's setting up our next story. Do we have anything else to say about Ahmad's story? Ahmad's story is sad. So Walter's story was, because I hadn't seen this movie in a long time, but when I was younger, I was just kind of like whatever about it. But looking at it now, I don't know. It just, that, that one made me really sad. And the director, I think that the reason that he wanted to actually be in that story, he had an experience when he was growing up. I think he actually witnessed some child abuse. And I think his father, I think who was a police officer, I think he told his father about it. And it was like at one of his white friend's houses and his father was like, there's not really anything I can do about that. I think he was like kind of acknowledging that even at the time, even in like the position that his father was in, it's hard to like interfere with somebody's like family stuff. Cause a lot of people see like, quote unquote disciplining children as like a, that's a family thing there is a line between like disciplining your children and like abusing them. But you know, it's like people are always like, that's kind of up in the air, right? What people consider abuse or not. Her discipline is in quotations because she did them like she, I could see them, but. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. When I'm saying this, I was trying to convey the quotations with my voice, but yeah, so I'm saying discipline because at the end of the day, it's not really discipline, right? It's like you're beating your children. People go way too far and you would never want to be beat like that. So I don't really see why people feel like it's okay to like beat children this way. Like this is the way that you teach children when it, it's really, that's not an effective way to like teach children to do anything. And so right. I think that the situation that he saw this, this, this incident of abuse, I think it really stuck with him. And so I was reading a quote by him and he was just like, he has I guess, like a real soft spot for child abuse, domestic violence. And so I think that that's why he chose to be a part of Walter's story. And I like the way that it was done. I like the idea of Walter seeing his abuser as a monster. I don't know. I think it would have been a more effective story if it hadn't been... David Allen Greer. David Allen Greer. Yes. I hate to say it, but it's like I, I felt so tickled so many times and I didn't want to because it's such a serious story. But yeah, so I had a really hard time watching Walter's story. Be just the, the scenes that David Allen Greer weren't in. Like when they were showing Walter crying, I was like, damn, this is really fucking sad. So the next story is KKK comeuppance. Uh, and I love comeuppance. In this story, we meet Duke Metger. And he's like a real piece of shit. So he is a senator and he's a former KKK member. He is a very thinly veiled David Duke. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's very thin. The veil is very thin. So we learn that he is running for governor. And he is doing this with the help of his Uncle Tom image manager and assistant, Rhody Willis. And Rhody's black, but if you closed your eyes and just listened to him, you wouldn't know it because he's also a piece of shit. So Metker is annoyed by the number of 
black and Jewish protesters that are outside of his house. And he says that, quote, if they were as relentless about finding a job as they were about hounding him, it might put an end to welfare. So it's just to give you guys an idea of how big of a piece of shit he is. He thought he really killed him with that one, huh? And then Rhodey's in the back just, like, co-signing this shit. But show Tim Scott motherfucking ass. I didn't like it. We cut to the protesters outside, and we learn that the Black and Jewish groups are protesting Mecker and just his candidacy in general, not only because he's, like, a blatant racist, a former Klansman, but also because, to add insult to injury... He has moved into an old slave plantation home, and it was previously owned by an, a man named Nathan Wilkes, who had a history of violence towards his slaves. So just as a news reporter is asking this man, the councilman Rogers, about what steps can be taken to kind of rectify the situation to find some sort of common ground, this man named Eli barges in, barges his way into this interview, and he says, we ain't got to do shit. We don't have to do shit. Because he says in so many words that the souls of Nathan Wilkes' slaves are inside the dolls, and they're going to make him pay for being in this plantation. He says that a woman named Miss Cobbs was the keeper of the souls, but she is gone now. And if you're confused by all of this, they'll explain more as we go along because we're confused too. So Rhodey questions Metger on why the house has the protesters so upset. And Metger explains how Nathan Wilkes, upon hearing that his slaves would be freed at the end of Civil War... He just couldn't, he couldn't deal with that. He snapped and he ended up massacring all of them. Hundreds of slaves, the lynchings, burnings. He put them in mass graves. And so Metger actually points to a mural of the woman, Miss Cobbs, that is painted on the wall behind them. She was a black woman. And in the mural, she's surrounded by all of her dolls. And he says that she was an old voodoo woman who bought the property and she was able to quiet all these restless souls that were kind of haunting the place that never moved on because they died in such tragic ways. She was able to quiet them by transferring them into a bunch of small, he says, Negro dolls that she created. And according to legend, the dolls are supposedly still in the house. And Metger said that he searched the entire house when he bought it, but he never found the dolls. So just to clarify, Miss Cobbs is someone that had owned the property for a while. After Nathan Wilkes and before Metger, she's died at this point. So, Rhodey is creeped out by the mural of Miss Cobbs, probably because she's looking down on him like he's a fucking disgrace. The look on her face is very judgmental. So, he's kind of getting a little shook by it. So, as the men are leaving the room, the camera actually pans down, and we as the audience see that one of the dolls is actually under the floorboard in the room. So as Metger and Rhodey are working on Metger's media skills, because he has none, because he's just really insufferable, Rhodey very dramatically falls down the stairs and he dies. <sighs> Refreshed. I know. We love it. So just as he is falling down the stairs... He's being filmed by Metger to do some practice runs of questions that he can answer. And we get a glimpse of one of the dolls, the one that was under the floorboard. And this doll is what Rhodey tripped on and fell down the stairs. Metger doesn't notice this right away. So we cut to Rhodey's funeral and Eli comes back. <laughs> Eli never misses an opportunity to barge his way through a crowd. Tell people how he feel. 
Right. He's very vocal. And he warns Metger to leave the house because the dolls don't want him there. And he's like, do you want to end up like Rhodey or worse? And I was like, what could be worse? Rhodey's dead. But I guess we find out, right? It could be worse. A lot of things things can happen to you, like what ends up happening to him. So Metger then says that he's not leaving the house. So he and the house will just have to find a way to get along. And then I thought this was so funny. He says, can't we all just get along? And there's some woman in the back that says, hell no. Bravo. She's like, why would you think we're going to get along with you? She's like, shut up. So in the limo after Rhodey's funeral, Mecker actually finds one of the dolls, like the one that was under the floorboard. It's sitting on the floor of the limo. And he orders his driver to pull over. And he's like, Who, like who's been in here? And his driver is like, nobody's been in here. And so Megger just throws the doll out the window. Later, as Megger's rewatching the footage that he was taping before Rhodey fell down the stairs, he realizes that Rhodey tripped over the doll. And it's the same doll that he found in the limo that day. And that's what killed him. So he's starting to get a little freaked out. So then he looks over and he notices in the painting of Miss Cobbs with all of her dolls, one of the dolls that she's holding in her hand, it's missing. It's just a white patch in the mural. So later that night, the doll, which is now animated, it runs all the way back to Metger's house to like fuck with him. So as the doll is running around, is driving Mecker crazy, he takes an American flag and he starts to beat Mrs. Cobb's mural. And the mural actually starts bleeding. And so now he's like done a lot, right? The doll decides to attack Metger at this point. And he jumps on him and he bites his neck. And Mecker manages to stop the doll by beating it with that same American flag. So then he takes the doll outside and he ties it to a dartboard and he shoots it with a shotgun. So during the course of all of this, Medgar is dropping some really hard R racial slurs, just left and right, just being a complete piece of shit. And he goes back inside to rant at Mrs. Cobb's mural some more and he realizes that more dolls pictures are missing from the mural he sees all these white spots and he's shook so he runs out of his office where the mural is located and he locks the door behind him but as he's running away in the hallway he sees the same doll that he shot with his shotgun and it tries to attack him again it chases him and he's forced to flee back into his office and he manages to lock the door with the doll outside But then he notices that all of the dolls in the painting are now missing. So he's terrified at this point. And so he turns around and he sees all of the dolls there. And they're being led by the one doll that he shot, the one that killed Rhodey, the one that was in his limo. And he takes the time to, like, cover himself with the American flag. And I was like, you fucking idiot. But the dolls all just converge upon him and they just start biting him, tearing him up, just like eating him alive, basically. Then we see that Miss Cobbs herself actually disappears from the mural. And then she appears in the room in her rocking chair and she's holding her doll in her arm and she's looking very satisfied by this justice that that's being dished out. The doll she's holding is the same doll that is at Sim's funeral home, which we now cut back to. That that one is shot very well. That one is shot the most like a horror movie. I agree. Because it has those kind of spine chilling moments. Fucking dolls. (laughs) I know. And I know that shouldn't be that scary, but for some reason, it was this story. That was the first one when we were like, we're going to do this movie. I was like, those fucking dolls. That one is scary. Because I guess the other ones are just like humans being pieces of shit. This is some supernatural type. 
that one is the one I'm always like, this is scary. And then just to see like a lot of, you remember this picture? What's different about it now? A lot of cutting back and then it's like, well, that doll was there. And like, and like first it's one doll missing and then like a few dolls missing. And then when he sees all the dolls. It reminds me of, I don't know what order we're doing these, but do you remember when we did um, Hell House LLC and it was like all of a sudden all those black ropes were all around us? Right. Like one minute the room is empty and then the next time you look, it's full of these figures. And that shit is really scary. It's a, it's very effective. Yeah. That's when it's scary. But I guess you have nothing to worry about if you're not a racist piece of shit. And if you just don't move into a plantation because it's just in bad taste right i know eli was probably like i did my part i tried to warn him i told you stupid ass <laughs> he didn't miss any sleep that night he's like i did what i was supposed to do so now that we're back at mr sim's funeral home the drug dealers are very very much over it so they are ready to get the shit the drugs and they really don't want to hear any more of Mr. Sims' stories. But it's at this moment that Ball notices one more corpse in another room. He recognizes this person. It's someone named Crazy K. So he then alerts the others to come see because he's kind of in disbelief. And when Mr. Sims walks in and asks them if they knew the man inside the casket, Ball immediately says yes, because he's kind of shook in this moment. But the others, specifically Bulldog, he says they didn't know him, that he was just somebody that they'd seen around the neighborhood, which is a lie, which Mr. Sims knows. So Mr. Sims then proceeds to tell Crazy K's story. So this is the fourth little vignette in the anthology. He tells them that Crazy K got involved in that crazy gang madness. So now we're entering the story. We're cutting to Jerome Crazy K Johns, who's driving around with the most absurd sideburns I've ever seen in my entire life. Do you think it was like the first makeup job of Tyler Perry? I don't know, because he also has a K shaved into the top of his head which is like i kept I, it took me forever to realize that's what the fuck it was i thought he had like a bald spot so we see crazy k catch up to a guy named lil deke and he proceeds to essentially gun little deke down in the middle of the street for i mean just talking shit which is alarming because I talk shit all the time. So I can't imagine if people were just out killing people for talking shit. Well, good thing you're not in Goodfellas. Well, but that's just how callous Crazy K is. That's how trigger happy he is. I mean, he essentially kills people for nothing. This is the point. Well, he's he's not called Compose K. <laughs> right. So... Once the gunshots ring out, some people that we're going to learn are Lil Deke's associates. They come out of the house that Lil Deke was about to go in. And so Crazy K starts running away. But Lil Deke's associates end up shooting Crazy K several times in the back. He falls to the ground and they all stand over him. So we can't see their faces they are distorted and their voices are distorted, but we can just see that there are three of them. So as they're standing over Crazy K's body, debating what to do, the police show up out of nowhere, out of thin air. And a gunfight ensues. So all three of the shooters start running and firing on the police. The police also start firing on them, and all three of the gunmen are shot and killed. Now, Crazy K is very badly injured, but ultimately he is saved by the cops, much to his chagrin. And so then we cut to him in prison, and this is four years later, and he is serving a life sentence without parole. So... 
he's been in solitary confinement for the past two years because he's continually assaulting other prisoners, really living up to the to the name Crazy K. And at this point, we meet Dr. Cushing. So she arrives at Crazy K's prison cell, and she asks him if he would like to be released from prison. Of course he would. She says that in order for him to be released, he has to consent to something called behavioral modification. Of course he agrees, because he will be in solitary confinement for the rest of his life. And he's pretty young, so he's looking at some hard time. So Crazy K is transferred to Dr. Cushing's facility. When he gets there, he sees some orderlies. They're rolling a cart with about four dead bodies hanging naked from their ankles. Which should have tipped him off that something is like very wrong with this place. But he doesn't really have a ton of time to process that before he's taken to his cell. So in just his boxers, he's placed inside his cell, which is essentially a cage that's like sitting room only. And he's next to a raging racist. This white supremacist is calling Crazy K a spade and an N-word. And just kind of, I mean, just r- running down the list. This supremacist also brags about killing Black people. And he rants about the war between Blacks and whites and how the end of days is coming for Blacks, except for those that join him and fight against other Blacks. So he says that those few Blacks will be spared And they will have the privilege of living out the rest of their lives as slaves. So he then asks Crazy K if he wants to be spared. Which is like, it's all very, it's like mad disrespectful. So Crazy K is of course angered by this. And he just clocks the dude in the face. Straight up. But the white supremacist really like, fucks with crazy k's head in this moment because he just laughs he's not really phased by it and he casually asks crazy k well what the hell was the race of the people that you were already killing which really silences crazy k he's stuck because what can you say right so then when dr cushing comes to get crazy k he's pissed at her that he was put next to a white supremacist But Dr. Cushing tells him that she purposely put him there so that he could meet someone just like him. She then tells him that she is being paid by the government to develop a rehabilitation program for inmates just like Crazy K. And he can either get through this program or if he fails, he's just going to have to rot in solitary confinement for the rest of his life. Which bothers Dr. Cushing's not at all. She already thinks he's scum anyway, so she's like, just don't fuck with me. So then Crazy K is put in a thong and strapped to this metal bed-like contraption and essentially tortured. It is giving very much a clockwork orange, if anybody has ever seen that. It's essentially the same kind of deal. So he's strapped to this metal bed. His his hair is shaved off. He has tubes pushed up his nose, electrodes attached to his chest. He has this ball gag that's forced into his mouth. And he is essentially forced to watch this series of images. These are actual images. You can find them online of real lynchings that have occurred throughout American history So it's actual Black people that have been lynched, tortured. It's extremely graphic, um, but extremely real. These are not images that were made for the movie. These are actual historical events. But commingled with these images of Ku Klux Klan members killing Black people, lynching Black people, is footage of really brutal gang violence. Some of it is real. And some of it is Crazy K's own violence against other black men. 
So it is a pretty long scene. Um, it's a lot of images and it is pretty brutal as well. So Dr. Cushing is really trying to drive home the fact that Crazy K has killed a lot of Black people, his own brothers, just like Cain did in the Bible. So once that is done, Crazy K is then lowered into a sensory deprivation chamber. And Dr. Cushing tells him that deprived of any other stimuli, his brain will have nothing to feed on but itself. In the chamber, he's confronted by the souls of the people that he has killed. So this includes one man that he felt was ripping him off. He had no proof of this. It was just a feeling that he had killed him. There's also some bystanders that were just kind of minding their own business. And they got caught in crossfire during a drive-by committed by Crazy K. They did nothing to him. They didn't know him, but they were killed nonetheless. And then he's confronted by a little girl, an absolute innocent. She said that she was killed when a bullet fired from Crazy K's gun came in through the wall of her bedroom. And so then it's just like they kind of start piling up in the room. We just see that Crazy K has killed a ton of people. So all of this really upsets Crazy K. He is distressed over this, but not in the way that you would hope. So he isn't feeling overly remorseful in this moment. Um, he just, he does feel like the world has been really unfair to him since he was born, which is it's probably true, but he blames everyone else for his actions. He just flat out refuses to accept any responsibility for his crimes. And Dr. Cushing tells Crazy K that she is giving him one final shot at redemption. And she warns him that he will not get another chance. But at this point, Crazy K is over it. He doesn't give a fuck. He doesn't even try to give a fuck. He stands up and he threatens to kill one of the female workers. And as Dr. Cushing is pleading with him, she's really trying. He just keeps repeating that he does not give a fuck. So now having refused the opportunity to redeem himself, Crazy K is transported back to the moment that he was shot and he's lying on the ground surrounded by these three men. Only this time, he is not saved by the cops. In this I don't give a fuck repeating state, the gunmen hear him say this. They're like, okay, great. They end up shooting and killing him dead. And that's how Crazy K's story ended. And that's how he ends up in Sim's funeral home. And then we cut back to the funeral home. What did you think about that particular story? This is my least favorite vignette of the movie. So I understand where they're going with this. But mm -hmm. for me, it completely misses the mark. Because the idea that you would compare KKK violence, centuries of violence against Black people to gang violence, is just so irresponsible. It is irresponsible, but the, I'm trying to think there's another word for it, too. It's just... It's a false equivalent. Would, it's looking at it from a very superficial like at least from the very surface, like it's, that's exactly right. It's a false equivalent. It's just like, yes, if, if you put it on paper, you're just like, well, this white person killed this black person and this black person killed this black person. At the end of the day, a black person died in both instances. It's not the same. Actually, I'm very happy that you brought that up because there is an article from Ebony Magazine in the 70s with Jesse Jackson and how this whole black on black crime saying started was because there was a real case where there were black people who had murdered one murdered the black person one murdered the white person and what they did was the judge gave them the same sentence 
to show that you know uh, the, the value of a black person's j- life is just as valuable as a, like, if a white person. But in classic American fashion, this phrase has become um, ubiquitous with whataboutism for racism as well as just the the terrorism that people, especially people like Crazy K, who live in these impoverished neighborhoods that they are subjected to. So let's be clear. Let's be clear and concise here. For them to mix those two things in the vignette, okay, well, there's just real violence of, of, of... these black on black crime, these gangbangers are coming in and they're killing and they're just like these KKK members killing these black people. You know, 13% of the population is doing 50%, 50% of the crime. It goes into that respectability politics. Well, if you just, you know, Dr. Cushing, she's like, just apologize. Well, whose fault is it? Is it your parents' fault? Is, is it your um, teacher's fault? Yes. There's a lot of, of blame to go around. These people don't just show up one day and say, hey, you know, I want to be, you know, I want to be impoverished. I want to live in the slums. I want to have desolate opportunities. Does that mean that going around killing people is right? No, it doesn't mean that's right. But to compare it to clan violence? It is irresponsible. I just, I really hate the term black on black violence because... Because, let's be clear, let me cut you off real fast, sorry, Ruth. Anybody who is murdered, is going to most likely be murdered by somebody of their same race. Because exactly. although there isn't as much redlining as there was, we as people live in homogeneous societies. Most white people live by white people, most Asians, that by Asians, most black looks by black, most Hispanics live by Hispanics. Right. So if there's a chance for you to be murdered, you're probably going to be murdered by somebody of your same race. Correct. What are you talking about? Additionally, you're comparing it in a way that you're like, oh, this black man killed this black man, just like this white supremacist killed this black man. But you're not taking into account everything that goes around the Ku Klux Klan. They, they just didn't kill somebody. It, it wasn't about just killing somebody, just taking someone's life. It's about control, psychological torture. I mean, on entire communities, it's not the same. And I, it's like, it's so frustrating because it's in a way not that gang violence especially during the 90s when it was at its peak it's not that it wasn't a serious issue I mean I've I used to watch this show gangland and it's it's really horrific some of the things that happen but it's not just black gangs it's skinheads it's Mexican gangs too it's a it's gang mentality those things are really horrific, but I just don't think that you can really compare it to the sadistic nature of the Ku Klux Klan, of people that have been afforded everything, that have everything, hold all the power to just want to press their thumb down and exert it on a group of marginalized people by lynching people in the street, taking photos, selling postcards of their mangled bodies. It's not the same. Bringing their children to watch it? To smile and eat cotton candy while they're watching people burn, hung from trees. It's not the same. And it's like, I I get what Rusty Kandif, the director, I get what he was trying to do. I totally understand where he was coming from. Not saying that gang violence doesn't affect people, even those not in gangs. You know, I know that innocent people suffer because of this. I'm sure that Rusty Kandif probably encountered a lot of, you know, stories about it. I don't know his background as much. I don't know if if he witnessed any of this himself, but it's, you know, I get his desire to make one of the vignettes about gang violence I totally get that I think maybe just where he missed the mark was comparing it to the Ku Klux Klan I mean he could have just shown him gang violence anything like that it's it's horrific enough and maybe he he felt like that wouldn't drive home the point enough that maybe Crazy K and we as the viewers wouldn't get this visceral reaction to it if we were just seeing, you know, this quote, black on black crime. But it's bad enough. What if he would have done, okay, at the very end of his big net, he's like, well, whose fault is it? Is it my teacher's fault? Is it 
is it my parents' fault? But what if we would have done something a little Christmas carol where we got to see different stages of his life and where where things took a left turn, you know? Yes, but that's but Rusty Kandif didn't want to tell that story. He didn't want to get into that. No, and that is just like when you see things on, on TV. You think people just show up one day and they just start killing? Right. You think every black person is just a gangbang and that if they just pull up their pants and, and read a book? Children are not born gangbangers, despite what a lot of people want to believe. I understand what he's saying. Like, Crazy Cage should have taken the onus for what he was doing. What he was doing was wrong. And at that point, to be given this one final chance for redemption and to turn it down. I mean, what he was doing was kind of crazy. But it's, you cannot, Rusty Kundi, Dr. Cushing, you can't dismiss parenting. You can't dismiss teachers. You can't dismiss environment. School of Prison Pipeline, do you think people just make that stuff up because they feel like writing books? Are we supposed to now, at the end of his life, you're just saying, well, look at all the stuff you did. You need to just say that you're sorry, and then that's it. When he's literally like, when she's like, well, whose fault is it? And he's telling you. He was like, it's all those fault. Rusty Kandif, the reason that we didn't do a Christmas Carol style flashback through his life, which I'm sure would have been very horrible. It probably would have made it very tragic. You probably would have felt sorry for him. He didn't want you to. So we didn't get that. that. It's like he's sitting there and she'd already called him scum. She'd already told him that she didn't care if he rotted in prison and died. You remember when she said... All you have are just your your thoughts to feed on. So I guess that's a very light meal. Right. Yeah, so she played the fuck out of him. She was cooking. She was. But then I thought that that was really crazy, too, because they did, I think they did, like, an IQ test on him, and he was very smart. She mentioned that, too, that he did right. have a high IQ. IQ. That's why he was chosen for it. Right. It's not that he's not smart. It's not that he cannot be rehabilitated, but you're asking an adult male to to totally disregard his entire upbringing, everything that he's ever gone through, his life experience. And like at this point, it's like, well, why can't you just be, you know, better? Why can't you just stop what you're doing? Why can't you just pull up your pants? Right. And just do the right thing. And it's like, you know, instead of doing this behavioral modification therapy, she's a doctor, right? Like, instead of calling him a scumbag, could could you not sit with him for a second and say, let's unpack this trauma? Because she was very, very hard on him from the get go. So you keep calling him scum. You told him he's only scum. And now when he does this scummy thing by being like, you know what, fuck it, I just want to get out of here. Then you're like, well, please, I'm giving you one more chance. And it's like, well, how the fuck am I supposed to react to this? I agree with you that this vignette, I feel like, is more problematic than it is a teaching moment. It's just really of its time. Very much. All right, so... I think that was very well said. And I don't mean to rip apart what Rusty Kundif gave us you know i think that there is definitely a place for tales from the hood in in everybody's movie collection i think it's something that people should see i think that it's a must watch but i do think that you have to go in it you know thinking about some of the messages that are trying to be sent i yes it is absolutely true People should not kill other people, regardless of your race. You shouldn't kill your brothers, regardless of your race. Killing is wrong. That's the message. So now we're cutting back to Mr. Sims' funeral home. So this is the welcome to the mortuary epilogue. So this our story is coming to a close. Now back at Mr. Sims, Stackball and Bulldog are super pissed about this last story because at the very end of the story surprise surprise once the filter comes off their face and their voices are no longer distorted it's revealed that they are in fact the three gunmen who killed crazy k now they are extremely hostile with sims because he knows this obviously so they end up pulling a gun on sims and threatening him and at this point they're like we don't want to kill you yet We want you to take us to the shit right now. Give us our fucking drugs. So now 
they and Sims are driving straight off the rails at this point. So Sims leads them down into the basement. They didn't notice that while this was happening. He's just touching the light and they coming on. No, they didn't notice that. They're too focused on the shit. Ah, the shit. <laughs> yeah, so the whole time that they're he's leading them down into the basement, which he's leading them lower and lower, and it's like getting hotter and hotter. Like he's sweating. He's a little warm in here. So he he the whole time he's just like, ah yes, the shit. The doo-doo. <laughs> the poopity pop. <laughs> <laughs> Why is he so silly? <laughs> he's so silly. So when they get to the basement, at first they find some books and they're like, uh, what the fuck? <laughs> they're at this point they're ready to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, it's okay. I have it here in this back room. He tells him that the shit is in these three coffins because where else would he keep it? Now Stack Ball and Bulldog are just so fucking dense. I would have never went down there. Go get this. Go get it. Go get the shit and bring it up here. Why do I have to come down there with you? So they don't realize at this point what has befallen them. Because we all do. We do. Things are getting real fucking ominous. So they go into the room. They're giddy as hell. They go. They open the coffins. Surprise, surprise. In each of the coffins, each man finds his own corpse revealing that they have been dead this entire time they are shook i just want to say junior looked like a damn doll he looked bad like a <laughs> rice cake color I, I just maybe they did those two first and ran out of money and ran out you know how it is the, the makeup artist was e- either quit midway or they ran out of budget because this is a straight dummy <laughs> <laughs> that they forgot to like put makeup on. It's crazy. It's giving Bernadette in Candyman when she was a completely different color. And it's <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's giving it's giving Brenda in Scary Movie Three. Stop! When she was in her casket, she was frozen. <laughs> yeah, like white. Yes, that's exactly what it's like. And he looked at himself, and I know, like, everybody else was kind of shocked that they were dead. But I know that he was like, damn, that's what I look like at my funeral? And I'm not trying to make light of it. This is a serious scene, but it was I, it was one of the first things I noticed. They are panicking, and I'm like, damn. Because he opened his last. He opens his last, he was like, what? <laughs> so... Of course, they decide that the best course of action right now is to shoot Sims. So when they turn to him, also alarming, his eyes are glowing red at this point. Then Sims is able to disarm them by essentially turning the guns red hot in their hands until they drop them, which is also alarming. And he then explains to them that after they murdered Crazy K, they were then gunned down by some of Crazy K's boys in retaliation. And he ends the story by saying, I guess you didn't make it. And they're all reduced to tears. Wait, why are they crying so hard? In this moment, you almost almost feel bad for them because they are hysterical ball who is literally bawling at this point so he asks sims what the fuck are you trying to say that we're dead motherfucker and sims responds very (laughs) (laughs) it's 20 decibels louder than necessary so bulldog asks sims If they're dead, then what the fuck are they doing in a funeral home with his crazy ass? And I'm like, y'all are so fucking obtuse. Like, Y'all should have read those books that was over there. (laughs) I know. He was like, I've given you ample opportunity to come to terms with this. So Sims then replies, and this has since become kind of like an iconic line for these movies, this last part. So he says, this ain't no funeral home. 
It ain't the Terra Dome neither. Welcome to hell, motherfuckers. And then this fake snake tongue comes out of the very real gap. Very, very Jafar. It's giving Jafar. So he then transforms, of course, if you guys didn't see it coming, into Satan. He is the devil. So then the walls of the funeral home crumble away to reveal that they are, in fact, in hell. And fires start to consume the three drug dealers while Satan laughs. And this really epic chanting music comes on. And that is the end of the movie. That's how it ends. So the Rotten Tomatoes for this movie is a 58% critic and a 65% audience score. The IMDb is a 6.9 out of 10 with 9.5 thousand views. And some fun facts. So some of the dolls that were used in the KKK comeuppance story segment those dolls were later reused in the team america world police movie do you remember that movie Mm -hmm. i didn't know that i didn't know that either but like i feel like that's cursed i feel like something about that's real crazy so tom wright who's in the road cop revelation story he plays morehouse who's killed by the cops in the very beginning he is in another horror anthology movie um creep show 2 which came out in 1987 and very similarly to this movie he also plays a ghost that is getting revenge on his killer known as the hitchhiker so in the story Uh, KKK comeuppance with the dolls the antagonist in that story Duke Medgar so his name is actually a combination of two notorious real life white supremacists so there was former neo-nazi and Klansman that we know very well David Duke because of where we grew up not because we be kicking it with the KKK (laughs) yeah no we're we don't (laughs) We're not friends with David Duke or anything. It's just because of uh, we're from Louisiana. And then also a Klansman turned white Aryan resistance founder, Tom Metzger. Um, and then a fun fact that I didn't realize, but that you told me about Michael Massey, who is also in the first story who plays one of the corrupt police officers. He is actually in The Crow, which he also kind of plays a similar role in that as well. Yeah. Kill someone and they come back a year later to avenge their death. Right. And he is on the losing end of that. Both times. Both times. Um... He needs to get with the winning team. Oh, rest in peace. He's actually dead. I'm sorry. (laughs) But oddly enough, he is actually the person that accidentally killed Brandon Lee on the set of The Crow, which I think is so incredibly tragic. So traumatizing. He he, um, talks about it. He said like he thought about it like every day. He's like he never, it's something he never got over. Oh my god, could you imagine? I know, I I can't even imagine, I mean, just killing someone. Especially, so. I mean, you, like, that'd be like killing your friend, someone that you, yeah. you talk to. You see them every day, and then all of a sudden they're gone, and you feel like you're to blame. It's a, I can't imagine. Um. So yeah, that's all that I have for fun facts. Um. So what do you think? Is it a hit or a miss? Looking back on it now and watching it as a whole, I don't think it's something I would revisit. So if someone has listened to our episode and they're like, oh, I'm on the fence about it, I thought you could skip it. I think it's a miss there. Okay. 
I think that I disagree. Okay. I think that I am going to give it a hit just because I do think it's important in a lot of ways. I think it was really important for Rusty Kundif to make, you know, awesome. like shout out, yeah, for the culture. So shout out to him for that. I think it's packed with a lot of talent. Some of the performances are really stand out. Mr. Sims, obviously. David Allen Greer really knocks it out of the park. I mean, as over the top as his performance was, if you know anything about David Allen Greer, you're like shocked watching this. I just think that everybody did a good job. Ahmad, which is like not his name in this movie, just did a really good job. And I do think that it does touch on some very important topics within the Black community. I think that the his that particular story, the one with Ahmad and um, David Allen Greer about the child that's a victim of violence at home by their step parent. You know, I just think that those are important stories to tell. Somebody that is killed as a result of police brutality, who then comes back and gets his revenge. Like these, these are things that it's a fantastical way of retelling stories that I do think are important for people to see and hear. So I I am going to give it a hit for that. I think that you should watch it. You, you know, if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. But I think that you should see it. Um, It almost feels like a rite of passage for every Black kid to be traumatized by it. So. Oh, yeah. But yeah. So do you want to tell them about the social media? Yes, if you are sleeping under a rock, <laughs> <laughs> you don't know that we are on all the platforms. Our favorite is Instagram. We love to connect with you guys on our Instagram. Did you get that on film? We also have our Facebook. We have our YouTube channel and our email. If you don't have any social media and still want to connect with us. So it's all did you get that on film? Just all put together. And then the email's at gmail.com. Oh, yeah, at gmail.com. We're always just excited to hear from you. If you have ideas about new episodes, if you have, you know, critiques or just feedback or just want to say hi. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that's it for us this week, you guys. So happy Black History Month. Thank you for listening to these stories. We thought that they were important to highlight. And we look forward to doing this again next year. Next month will be a totally different theme, and we're very excited about it. But, (laughs) I mean, it couldn't be any more different. The movies have been fun to start to look at. I agree. So, we will see you guys again next week with a brand new episode. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye!